Hello and welcome. I'm Julie Heverly, the Senior Director of the Time and Range Coalition at Diatribe. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Musings panel discussion. Our conversation today is about preventing and treating some of the most serious complications of diabetes, specifically diabetes-related eye diseases that can lead to blindness, and peripheral artery diseases, or PAD, which can lead to lower limb amputation. Before we get started and introduce our panelists, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors who are making this and all of our Musings panels possible free of charge. A huge thank you to our generous gold sponsors, starting with Abbott, who does so much to improve the lives of people with diabetes, especially by making continuous glucose monitors or CGMs widely available to people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And to AstraZeneca, which has developed therapies that not only improve A1C and time and range, but also significantly reduce the risk and consequences of diabetes complications. Thank you to our dedicated silver sponsors, Bigfoot, the Boehringer Ingelheim Lilly Alliance, Dexcom, Genentech, Janssen, Lilly, and Vertex. All of these companies do so much for people living with diabetes and provide essential support to help Diatribe pursue its mission, our mission, of improving the lives of people with diabetes. As a person living with diabetes for over 20 years, I know how easy it is to become overwhelmed when thinking about all the possible complications of this disease. Of course, all of us with diabetes know that the most important thing that we can do to avoid complications is to be vigilant about managing our blood glucose, maximizing our time and range, and doing our best to keep our A1Cs in a healthy range. But in addition to doing this, which is already a full-time job, we must educate ourselves about the specific complications of diabetes. We must know how they can be detected early and what preventative measures and early treatments are available to avoid even more serious outcomes. It's important to have this knowledge so we can ask the right questions in those very brief appointments that we have with our healthcare teams and to keep on top of what we need to do so that we can stay healthy because we all know that this is a disease that we have to manage. That is what we at Diatribe hope that you will learn from today's panelists and that you'll leave this event feeling empowered to speak to your healthcare team and to advocate for your own best health moving forward. In just a few minutes, we're gonna hear from four experts about diabetic eye disease and PAD. We're gonna learn about the best ways that we can prevent them and detect them early so that we can get the treatments, including many new and highly effective treatments, in time to maintain healthy vision and avoid one of the most anxiety producing areas of complications, lower limb amputation. Before I produce or introduce our panelists, I want to encourage everybody joining us today to add your comments and questions for the panelists in the stage chat area. You'll see it on the right side of your screen. And at the end of the discussion, we will save some time so that our panelists can answer some of your questions. Now, get your fingers ready to type your questions and let me introduce our speakers today. First, we have Dr. Emmanuel Amador. Dr. Amador is an ophthalmologist and holds the position of Medical Director in Ophthalmology Medical Affairs at Genentech. He's a retina specialist skilled in retina imaging and the management of inflammatory, autoimmune, and systematic diseases affecting the eye, as well as diabetic retinopathy. Dr. Amador is also a clinical epidemiologist and works on improving diversity and inclusion in clinical trials, an incredibly important issue. Welcome, Dr. Amador. Next up is Dr. Richard Brown. Dr. Brown is a cardiologist who joined Johnson & Johnson in 2021 and holds the position as Senior Medical Executive in Health System Strategies for Janssen Pharmaceutical in Cardiovascular and Metabolism Therapeutic Area. While practicing as a cardiologist, he held leadership positions at several large healthcare systems. Dr. Brown serves as a council member of the North Carolina chapter of the American College of Cardiology, 
where he is actively involved in formulating strategies to reduce healthcare disparities in cardiovascular patients. Welcome, Dr. Brown. We're also thrilled to welcome Dr. Diana Isaacs, who is a frequent contributor to Diatribe. You might recognize her. She comes to us from the Cleveland Clinic Endocrinology and Metabolism Institute and brings her perspective as both a clinical and an endocrinology clinical pharmacist, as well as a doctor of pharmacy and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. Whew. That's so much. <laughs> Dr. Isaac serves on the ADA's professional practice committee that updates the ADA's standards of care. And in 2020, she was named Diabetes Care and Education Specialist of the Year by ADCES. She advocates for access and choice, the latest technologies and therapeutics for all people with diabetes. And finally, we are fortunate to have another leading ophthalmologist who works on the cutting edge of screening and treating diabetes-related eye diseases, Dr. Paulo Silva. Dr. Silva, in addition to being on a staff ophthalmologist and co-chief of telemedicine at Beetham Eye Institute of the Joslin Diabetes Center, is also an associate professor of ophthalmology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Silva's clinical and investigative work is at the intersection of clinical care, technology, and artificial intelligence with the goal of increasing access to diabetes eye care for those populations that need it most. His work has been recognized with more than 29 national and international awards. With all of this knowledge at our fingertips, we are going to get started uh, discussing these two areas of complications and then get into some prevention screenings and treatments. So welcome, everybody. We're thrilled to have you here tonight. And we are just going to dig right in, starting with you, Dr. Brown. So you are a cardiologist, and both areas of these complications that we're talking about tonight stem from the impact of high blood sugar levels on the circulatory system, but in different ways. Peripheral artery disease, known as PAD, is one of the macrovascular complications of diabetes. Can you please share with us what that means and what is going on in the circulatory system that leads to this specific PAD condition? Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity and I welcome everyone who is on the line today and here to learn. I um, am a cardiologist. I've practiced clinical cardiology for 21 years. Um, and quite frankly, diabetes had a personal toll on me. I, I am not diabetic, but my father-in-law was diabetic. He had every complication of diabetes, um, coronary artery disease. He had kidney disease, ended up on dialysis, and then had some of the worst outcomes from diabetes, amputation, losing his left leg, followed by his right arm, and then his right leg was amputated. And then he died before the age of 60 and never had an opportunity to meet his grandson, my son, Ricky. So this is very, very dear to me. So what was going on in my father-in-law? Really and truly, you have to think of the blood vessels in your body of being two types. There are veins that return blood from the body to the heart. And then there are arteries that take blood from the heart to the body. And what diabetes affects are the arteries. And I want you to think of three main types of arteries in your body. There are the coronary arteries, which take blood to the heart themselves. There are the carotid arteries, which take blood to the head and to the brain. And then there are the peripheral arteries, which take blood to the arms and to the legs. All arteries have the same structure. They have an outside structure, which is what we call connective tissue that holds the blood vessel together and gives it strength. Then there's a middle layer of the artery called the media. And it's basically muscle and allows the blood vessel to get bigger or smaller. And then the innermost layer of an artery is called the intima. And that's a very important layer because all of the blood that is going through an artery is touching the intima. If you have cholesterol that is high, a plaque can start to form. If that plaque starts to form, 
it then can attach itself to the inner lining of the artery. As that occurs, it can trigger a series of events, namely platelets, which are the sticky substances in your blood, might want to attach to the plaque, which can then cause a clot to form, and then more platelets, more clot, and then eventually you can have an occlusion of that artery. If it's the artery going to the brain, you can have a TIA or a stroke. If it's the artery going to the heart, you can have a heart attack. And if it's the arteries going to your arms or your leg, you can have the signs and symptoms of peripheral artery disease, with the worst being the worst complication and amputation. Wow, that's a lot. Thank you so much for explaining all that. It's very helpful. So Dr. Amador, on the opposite side, diabetic eye diseases are one of the microvascular complications of diabetes. What does this mean and how does it lead to diabetes complications? Thank you. And thank you for this great opportunity to share some of these uh, very important, relevant uh, details with, with this amazing audience. Uh, so diabetic retinopathy overall, uh, similar to what Dr. Brown was kind of explaining, uh, the involvement, we're talking now about micro vessels. So vessels that are micro, microvasculature are the little vessels that we see uh, in, in a, a little deeper layers or deeper levels of the of the vasculature. And these vessels are mostly uh, in the retina, which is one of the most important layers of the eye. The eye is divided by multiple layers, but the one that actually helps us to see or to be able to to, to see everything uh, or, or have to our, our day to day is, is the retina. Uh, that's why this is called, uh, or these issues uh, are called diabetic retinopathy. We are, it's a disease that affects the retina, specifically a very important, crucial part of the retina called the macula. Once it starts affecting that area of the retina, we start seeing problems of vision and patients start having the symptoms that actually are, are the, 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 some of the most relevant comorbidities. And last a uh, step of the of the disease could be even complete vision loss because this problem can continue and can continue progressing and if it continue affecting that specific area then vision is lost uh, this um, microvasculature is very similar to the microvasculature that it's also involved in other organs like for example the kidney so when we are starting to see already some organs that are affected it's very likely that the eye might already be affected. So it's always good to be screening or looking into the eye, which is something that it's very easily done just by an optometrist or by an ophthalmologist to look if there are signs of the disease in the retina, just by looking into the pupil uh, with an eye exam, it's very easy to actually determine if there's already some early signs of, of diabetic retinopathy. So there's a very great way of actually looking for it and screening that, that makes things much, much easier for patients. That is good news for those of us who are living with this disease. Dr. Silva, what are the different types of diabetic eye diseases and how are they related to each other? So again, thank you for having me here. So diabetes affects all parts of the eye, not just the retina. But sometimes, you know, really much of the focus has been on retinal complications. Patients with diabetes are at a higher risk for developing age-related cataracts. They can also develop glaucoma. For retinal conditions, it affects primarily in, in the, it manifests primarily in two ways, either a condition called diabetic retinopathy, where you can get bleeding or changes in the blood flow in the eye, as well as development of new vessels. This is called diabetic retinopathy. You can also have a disease called diabetic macular edema. Dr. Amador briefly touched on this. So diabetic macular edema is when you have swelling of the part of the eye called the macula. The macula is responsible for a central vision. It's also responsible for why we have clear, crisp vision. So when we have diabetic macular edema, vision is substantially affected. Um, Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that information. Um, now, Dr. Isaacs, I'm going to turn to you for hope for those of us patients out here. 
we know that maintaining a healthy glucose level is really important for both the eye disease, for avoiding eye disease, and for avoiding PAD. Can you share with us what the role of technology and time and range can play in, in, in us avoiding these complications in the future? <laughs> Well, I am here to offer hope. And uh, I also want to thank you so much for having me and being with this distinguished panel. So there is so much hope. There's been so much progress in terms of diabetes technology, which is making it easier to reach those glucose targets and time and range. We, in terms of insulin pumps, the technology has improved so much. And now we have automated insulin delivery systems or hybrid closed loops that are actually automating that background insulin. And many systems also can give automatic corrections to help get glucose into range and increase that time spent in target range. Even continuous glucose monitors or CGM by itself has been a tremendous help. Just the whole thing with time and range. I mean, before we had that, we had A1C, which is an average of your glucose. And yes, A1C is important. It's tied to outcomes, but it doesn't really tell you. It's just an average. So you could have tons of lows and tons of highs, and you could be meeting that target, but that doesn't mean you're going to have great outcomes. So now we really can utilize that time and range, and people can take, they're empowered to take it to really see how they're doing and not have to wait until that next A1C is coming along. And then just in addition to insulin pumps, because we know not everyone wants to be on an insulin pumps. Uh, also, the technology has evolved with connected insulin pens that offer features to help people to calculate their insulin doses and to track active insulin in the body so they don't overcorrect. So really, it has, even though it's still hard, it's still a lot of hard work managing diabetes, there are so many more tools that do make it a little bit easier and have been shown to improve quality of life as well. Wonderful. So the message is do everything you can to stay healthy and, and keep your blood glucose in range so that we can avoid these complications. But now we're going to turn to how do we recognize them? What do we need to know about screening? So how do we talk to our healthcare providers about this? So Dr. Brown, I'm going to turn back to you and ask you, what are the symptoms that a person with diabetes should be watching for um, that might indicate that they, they have PAD? Very good question. So if you have diabetes, diabetes actually increases your risk of developing PAD sevenfold. What happens in someone with high blood sugars is that process of a plaque forming in an artery and obstructing that artery, it gets accelerated when your blood sugar is not poorly controlled. Now think about this. Think about a situation where the blood supply to your legs is now compromised. It can cause a variety of symptoms. And I want you to pay attention to these symptoms because if you have any of these symptoms, you should address it with your healthcare provider. So the most common symptom is cramping in the back of your leg. So that is called claudication, where you walk and you notice that the back of your calves hurt whenever you walk. That's a sign of peripheral artery disease. Also numbness or weakness in your feet could be an indication. If you notice that your feet are very cold, all of a sudden every night you have to put on six, seven blankets to keep your feet warm, the cold feet might be an indication that there's not enough blood supply going to your foot and your toes. The other thing that you should pay attention to is burning sensation in your legs or feet. Hair loss. So if you start noticing that the hair on your legs or your arms starts to go away, that could be an indication of peripheral artery disease. And if you have any foot sores, so you notice a sore on your um, the sole of your foot and it's not healing over time, that could also be an indication of peripheral artery disease. So there's lots of symptoms that you can develop that indicate PAD. I also want to point out, though, that 40%, that's right, 40% of patients with diabetes and peripheral artery disease have no symptoms at all. So if you are asymptomatic, it does not mean that you're out of the woods. 
So are there so are tests there, that can yeah. predict it or, you know, screen for it in, if you are asymptomatic? That's a very, very good question also. So there is a very simple non-invasive test called the ABI. It stands for ankle brachial index. So you take the blood pressure in your leg around your ankle. You take the blood pressure in your arm. Your brachial artery is in your arm. That's the B. And then you create an index, a ratio. So for instance, if the blood pressure in your leg is 100 and the blood pressure in your arm is 100, your ratio is 100 over 100. 1 1.0 is your ABI index. But let's say you start developing peripheral artery disease and now the blood flow is compromised to your leg. The blood pressure in your leg is going to go down. So in that situation, your blood pressure in your leg might be 80 while the blood pressure in your arm remains 100. Your ABI is 80 over 100 or 0 0.8. When the ABI falls below 0 0.9, that is an indication of potential peripheral artery disease. And this again is a non-invasive test. It is basically checking the blood pressures in your arms and your legs and comparing them to each other and something that can be easily done in a physician's office. I have definitely had that done before and now I know why. So thank you for that information. Dr. Amador, how are people with diabetes typically screened for diabetic eye diseases and how often should this screening be happening? Definitely. That's a, that's a wonderful question and something that, that it's, it's very crucial for, for the audience to also be very aware of. So, so first of all, symptoms wise, uh, it's the, the diabetic retinopathy can be completely asymptomatic. Sometimes diabetic retinopathy can start even in one eye and doesn't really manifest in the other eye. And our brains might not even notice, our brains, sorry, might not even notice that we have an eye that uh, has limited vision and the other one is working well and it's compensating. So it's always very, very good to kind of bring awareness or try to screen as soon as patients are diagnosed with diabetes. These screenings should be done every, ideally every year. Uh, depending on the severity, screenings can happen a little bit more often. But ideally, one every year, just have a, a regular checkup with your ophthalmologist, retina specialist, just to look into, into, into your eye. A fundus exam will suffice. Um, even they can uh, even take a picture so you can even see or, or understand a little better of what's going on and also have a comparator throughout the different uh, time points that that, uh, that you guys have been kind of uh, attending the, the, the clinic. Interesting, I never thought to ask for those pictures, but I definitely saw mine last night when I had my appointment. So good information to have. Um, Dr. Silva, I think what you are doing at the Joslin Center with telemedicine is so very interesting. Um, I understand that there is new technology for people who don't have easy access to um, an eye specialist like Dr. Amador was talking about. So can you tell us a little bit about how this new screening through telemedicine works and how it can increase access to this important eye screening? So, uh, you know, this type of screening isn't really new. It's been here for almost two decades already. So the strategy here is to provide access to eye care to people who commonly don't have access to eye care or to provide access to eye care in places that, uh, you know, are not traditional places you would seek eye care. So typically these types of uh, screening programs are located in primary care offices or in, in endocrinology clinics. So these rely on retinal imaging or pictures of the retina. So typically these photos are taken of the eye without the use of dilation without the use of dilating without the use of pupillary dilating drops and it's easy fast convenient simply done within less than 15 minutes and these telemedicine devices or retinal cameras are able to diagnose the presence and severity of the retinal disease present in, in the eye so there are a lot of places that have this you know you can ask your primary care office or your endocrinologist if the if they have access to these devices, most of the federal programs have access to these, the Veterans Affairs, the Indian Health Service, most of the federal programs have access to these. So this technology relies on photography, takes a photo of the retina, 
and these are sent to your ophthalmologist or uh, a centralized center wherein they evaluate the images. They can also utilize artificial intelligence wherein the photos are evaluated and there's programs that are able to detect whether you have disease present in the images. Wow. The idea of not having to be dilated is very intriguing, but I think the fact that we can serve more people with this wonderful technology that uh, I apologize, I didn't realize had been around so long, um, but with the way that the world is going, it's, it's great that we're making this more available to people who need it. So thank you so much for sharing that and continuing to promote it. Um, so we know we're going we're gonna to move to um, the incidences of of these complications. And we have a lot of people that are joining us today who have both type one and type two diabetes or are caretakers for people who are of both um, types of diabetes. So I wanna hear from Dr. Brown, um, with regards to the higher risk groups, is there any evidence that higher incidence of PAD and lower limb amputation is linked to race? So, you know, and unfortunately the answer is yes. So if you look at black Americans, their risk of having peripheral artery disease is twice as high as white Americans. So double the, the prevalence. The other thing is if you look at black Americans compared to white Americans, their risk of having an amputation due to peripheral artery disease is four times as high. That's in all black Americans. Now, if you then add in the complication of diabetes on top of someone with peripheral artery disease, the risk of amputation now goes up 15-fold. So diabetes in itself is a significant risk factor for peripheral artery disease, but race, black race um, being the most prominent, is also a significant risk factor. I should also point out that number two in the, um, um, in, in the race, um, sorry for the pun, is actually Hispanics. Hispanics also have a significantly higher rate of peripheral artery disease compared um, to whites. And then Asians are third. So there is um, great evidence that if you are either black or Hispanic, your risk of peripheral artery disease is significantly higher than whites. Wow, that's alarming and important for us to keep in mind and connects with some of the work that Dr. Amador is doing. So Dr. Amador, I understand that Genentech is conducting clinical trials that are focused on the efficacy and safety of its therapies for diabetic eye disease, different than PAD, obviously, but specifically in underrepresented patient populations. Why do you think that this is so important? And more importantly, what are you hoping to learn from all of this? Yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, there has to be a lot of awareness that, as, as, as Dr. Brown was mentioning, that these populations are the ones uh, that are having the most uh, complications, unfortunately, of the diabetic retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy can go even further and complicate even more when it's starting to affect the macula, which is that part of maximum vision. And this is called diabetic macular edema. This is something that needs treatment as soon as possible because it's actually affecting the vision and affecting long-term outcomes for the vision in patients. So approximately in the, in the United States, this, this type of, macula, of, of diabetic macular edema, almost 700,000 people live with this in the United States, and the incidents continue increasing uh, the, 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 the more the, the years have passed. So an estimate of the, of the, of the, um, of the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy in, in Hispanics is about 33% and 26% in black and 18 compared to 18% in whites in the diabetic population. So definitely there's, there's a higher prevalence in these groups. And looking into this, uh, Genentech kind of understood that there's a huge gap in which we see a lot of different um, therapies that are mostly um, a, a lot of the clinical trials that have been done are including populations, but not necessarily representative of the populations that are, are actually having the diseases, like, for example, African-American and Latin-American or Native American. So what we wanted to do is to bring 
these populations into our clinical trials and we decided to focus just one single study into just having this uh, with, with, with these populations to try to better understand first their baseline uh, and second, how well are they responding knowing that these populations tend to arrive a little later to, uh, to the, the clinics or, or potentially with worse disease. So definitely something that we're looking forward to learn more and to see if, what kind of impact are all these different variables uh, having on, 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 the, on the treatment of these populations. Yeah, I think we could probably designate an entire series of musings series panel discussions to this topic. And unfortunately, we don't have, you know, unlimited time tonight. So I want to make sure that our audience leaves with um, the hope of the treatments that are coming um, into our, our world right now. And so um, we're going to we're going to move to those treatments and we're going to talk about some of the major advancements that um, with early detection can really help patients avoid um, sort of the, the really serious complications that we've been discussing. Um, Dr. Isaacs, I'm actually going to turn to you. And um, we noted that earlier in the conversation, Dr. Brown was talking about the risk factors um, beyond diabetes that can contribute to PAD and, um, you know, the all the different types of, of issues that, that people who are living with this chronic condition have to deal with, like high blood pressure, like elevated cholesterol. So what are some of the medications that can help reduce those risks for people who are living with diabetes? And who should be thinking, I need to talk to my doctor about this? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of great medications to help with blood pressure and to help with cholesterol. And fortunately, in those categories, there's a lot of generics, so they're more affordable. So for example, with cholesterol, really the gold standard first line medication is to be on a statin. And those are available as generics. And um, the guidelines really recommend anyone over the age of 40 with diabetes benefits from being on a statin. Uh, lower age too with, with certain risk factors. And that's a, a good conversation to have because um, I know it's a goal for a lot of people that they say, okay, I, I'm going to exercise a lot or I'm going to lose weight or whatever, and I want to get off medication. But really, many of these medications have been shown to have benefits, even when you get the numbers to goal. So statins are, are definitely one of those classes. When it comes to blood pressure, we have a few different classes of medications. Uh, again, many generics in this world. If someone has kidney disease, for example, we usually lean toward a medication class called an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, also available as generics. But one other area I really want to highlight is our advancements with diabetes medications that now also have benefits in terms of advantages for cardiovascular disease and in you know, being able to prevent heart attacks and strokes. And so those classes include GLP-1 receptor agonists. I know these are like a lot of big words, and I'm sorry. Um, examples of those are, I'm going to use the generic names, uh, liraglutide, semaglutide, dulaglutide. Um, and then we also have the SGLT2 inhibitors. Those work on the kidneys, and examples are empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, canagliflozin. And these, it's so interesting because of course these drugs lower glucose levels and increase time and range, which is important and helps to prevent these complications. But even irrespective of glucose levels in type two diabetes, they've been shown to, um, to improve cardiovascular outcomes. Um, some people with type one diabetes use these off label. They haven't been studied. Um, about cardiovascular outcomes, but we definitely have a lot of strong data for people with type 2 and even some other conditions like those with kidney disease and those with heart failure. And then one other thing I just want to point out, which is kind of interesting, because of course the goal is to lower glucose levels, increase time and range, but there is some risk with when it comes to eye disease. If you lower glucose levels very, very quickly and the eye disease is not controlled, it actually can initially worsen outcomes. And so I just want to reiterate what you've heard, the importance of having those regular eye exams so you have that eye health. And so it's safe to start taking these medications to lower the glucose levels. 
That is a great point. I definitely, when I decided to start my family, dealt with that because we dropped my A1C very quickly so I could have a healthy pregnancy and it did. Um, it did have some impact on my eyes. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and that's actually, it's one of the reasons in pregnancy, especially we, we recommend more eye exams every trimester of pregnancy because usually we're getting those glucose levels lower, lower than they may have been recently. Yes, definitely in my case, it was that way. Um, Dr. Amador, what are the treatments for diabetic eye disease once, you know, once it's either been detected in a screening or people have started to notice symptoms and they've talked to their professionals and how soon after the problem has started to, you know, really um, be noticeable should we be treating it? Yes, Julie, this is also very important to, to, for people to understand that Initially, diabetic retinopathy is something that we can actually just observe. Uh, it's something that can potentially improve with good management of, of the diabetic disease. Uh, but there's also uh, that moment in which the diabetic retinopathy has become so severe that it becomes, um, it, it becomes even more complicated and it starts affecting areas of the retina that could put it in, in danger, especially the vision. So it could be we could be considered treating when the diabetic retinopathy is already proliferative, that's the term that we use, or when there's already fluid in the macula, meaning that the, there's so much inflammation that, that the layers of the retina in the central area are, are becoming, uh, there, there's trouble in, in, in the central retina. That's the moment that we need to start thinking about treatment. Uh, the current standard of care, uh, we are very fortunate that in 2006 or early 2000s, uh, there was a, a big development of some drugs that focused specifically on treatment of that kind of, of edema. They're called anti-VGF or intravitreal injections. And, and they're very specific and they're actually, they work really well to treat these kind of complications. Uh, it's an injection, of course, into the eye. So it's, of course, uh, it does uh, cause some uh, anxiety on some of our patients, but it's definitely not as bad as, as it might you might think. The needle is actually very thin, very small. Patients actually, usually my patients, they tend to not feel the injection at all. Uh, you just don't think about it, kind of the, the injection part at all, and, and definitely things are going to be fine. Uh, it is very, very, the, the therapies currently that, that exist are, are actually very, very impactful on the, on the disease. Uh, the main issue now is, is the burden of these injections. How often do you need this kind of treatment? Uh, in the first year, you usually need to give some loading doses because the disease kind of requires for you to have an injection monthly. Uh, and then you can start extending potentially if you are already kind of being uh, well uh, managed on, on the disease. Uh, but right now, newer therapies are starting to appear that allow even more extension. So even more periods of time without injections, which I, as you can imagine, patients love because they, nobody wants to have injections monthly or every two months. So newer therapies are actually starting to appear, uh, new treatment modalities with different mechanisms of action. So there, it's an exciting time right now for for the, 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 the patients with diabetic macular edema in which there's, there are much better uh, sophisticated treatments right now. Okay, Dr. Silva, um, I, I've heard that there are also laser treatments. So can you share with us what the pros and cons might be of injections versus laser treatments? And what would be the factors that somebody would, you know, one over the other would be the better course of treatment? So, so any treatment for diabetic eye disease is really a very personal decision. So anybody who is who needs treatment would need to work with their eye care provider so that they can get the appropriate treatment and recommendations that would be suit that would suit their own scenario and situation. So, but really for treating diabetic macular edema the standard of care are injections. So injections provide the best outcomes and uh, pro provide the best outcomes for patients with diabetic macular edema. So these are, as Dr. Amador said, given on a monthly basis, and then the interval between the injections are slowly extended. For diabetic retinopathy, wherein you have bleeding in the eye, so options would include laser treatment or 
injections as well. So with injections, you'll need to do this on a monthly basis and extend it over time. With laser treatment, it's usually a one and done deal. So they get one treatment and they're followed over time. And over the course of 10 years, about 50% of patients will need a second treatment. Uh, okay. Laser treatment provides long-term stability for diabetic retinopathy. However, injections provide slightly better outcomes in terms of the visual field. So with laser treatment, it's an inherently destructive procedure. While these injections provide less constriction of the visual field, they also prevent the occurrence of diabetic macular edema, as well as reducing the risk for vitrectomy surgery in the eye. So as I know, I, I want to end with a really the injections or lasers are really a personal choice and they need to work with their eye care providers to be able to determine what's best for them. Absolutely. We want everybody to have really good conversations with their healthcare providers and the information that you all are sharing. Help us as patients have those conversations. So thank you. Dr. Brown, I want to jump back to PAD because once it's been diagnosed, once we've noticed the difference between um, you know, the, the feelings in our legs, the pulses in our legs, or the cramping. Once it's been diagnosed, what is the treatment options and how effective are these treatments for patients who are starting to feel these, um, these complications uh, and, and challenges in their lives? Um, good question. So Dr. Isaacs touched on some of the treatments to um, um, effectively manage peripheral artery disease. Uh, one is obviously lowering the blood pressure. And if you're thinking, well, what should be my blood pressure goal? Well, the top norm of your blood pressure is called the systolic pressure. When the heart squeezes, it pushes blood into arteries and your blood pressure rises. That, that's the top number in your blood pressure. And then the heart relaxes and starts filling with blood again. That is called diastole. And the bottom number is called your diastolic pressure. So you, if you're a diabetic, you really want that top number to be less than 130, and you want the bottom number to be less than 80. So there are medications that are designed to reduce the blood pressure significantly so that we know that having high blood pressure sort of bangs against the inside of those blood vessels and increases the chances of plaque forming. Um, we also mentioned statin drugs and lowering the bad cholesterol called the LDL. Some other things though that you can do is if you're overweight, we know that being overweight increases your risk of peripheral artery disease. So weight loss and eating a healthy diet is important. The other thing is when your doctor is checking your blood, you want your doctor to screen for the possibility of kidney disease. So there's a blood test and there's also a urine test that can be done looking for evidence of kidney disease because we know as the kidneys start to fail, your risk of peripheral artery disease also goes up. Tobacco abuse, smoking quadruples your risk of peripheral artery disease. So if you're smoking, cut back significantly or stop altogether because that is one of the biggest risk factors for peripheral artery disease. Inactivity is also a risk factor. As a matter of fact, when you have peripheral artery disease, one of the best treatments is a walking program. Once you have developed disease in your legs, regular exercise actually stabilizes the plaque in the arteries and can help with regression and help reduce the symptoms of peripheral artery disease. And then at the beginning, I mentioned the fact that what can happen in an artery is a plaque forms and then platelets stick and then a blood clot can form. Well, sometimes we use antiplatelets, like for instance, aspirin to treat those platelets and make them less sticky inside the blood vessels to your legs. And then there is a blood thinner called rivaroxaban, which um, prevents blood clots from forming in arteries and is also an effective treatment for peripheral artery disease. Now on the surgical or mechanical side, there are things that we can also do which we call revascularization. That's a big fancy medical term for restoring the blood supply to an artery. And there are two ways that that can be done. The first is more invasive, where a vascular surgeon opens your leg and then bypasses the blockage. 
either takes a vein from another part of your leg and bypasses the blockage in the artery, or they might use what they call a prosthesis, something they get from a manufacturer to bypass the leg. The other thing that can be done less invasively is an angioplasty procedure where a cardiologist or a radiologist or a vascular surgeon goes into that artery, blows up a balloon to push that plaque to the side, and then very often put in something called a stent to keep that blood vessel open. So there are lots of options for the management of peripheral artery disease. The big thing is early detection, because ultimately the best world would be one in which PAD is discovered early, treated early, and the patient does not end up needing a revascularization procedure, does not end up having a stroke, does not end up having a heart attack. Yes, that is the ideal situation. Um, and, and we hope that with the information that folks are getting, that we'll be able to prevent more people from experiencing these complications. Dr. Isaacs, if somebody who's living with diabetes is in your care um, and they experience one of these complications, how do you help them navigate the next steps and also process the emotions and the self-blame that they might have that are connected to ending up um, with these complications? Well, I never want someone to blame themselves. No one should ever blame themselves. Managing diabetes is hard work. And especially for someone that's had diabetes a long time, I mean, you think about the therapies we used to have, um, you know, just like NPH and regular insulin. And it was a lot harder to be able to achieve time and range, to get to A1C targets. So it's just, it's hard work and there's no reason to have any kind of blame. And we also know that doing these things helps to reduce risk, but there's also genetic components. And we all know there's some people that just do everything right perfectly and still end up with complications and, and vice versa. So yes, it's important to do all the things, to take all the therapies, but no, there's an element that is a little bit out of our control. And so I I don't want anyone to ever blame themselves. And also seeking behavioral health specialists is great. Um, we often make referrals to kind of sort through some of that possible guilt and blame. Um, now, that being said, we now have so many more amazing tools than we ever did before. We talked at the beginning about the new tech tools. We even have better insulins now. And we have all these therapies to treat the complications. So. I would say the future is bright. There is a lot of hope. If a complication's already there, we can treat it. And we know by you know using CGM, taking advantage of that and really increasing time and range, we get, get the best shot of reducing or worsening any of those complications. So please just don't blame yourself. It is not your fault. Thank you for sharing that. I think the the patient population needs to hear that occasionally because we know how we are supposed to live, but sometimes life interferes. And so it's really important that folks um, practice some, some self-care and some self-grace. So thank you for sharing that. We, um, we have a couple more minutes before we move over to the audience question portion. And so I want to give all of our panelists an opportunity to leave us with some hope. So Dr. Brown, I'm going to ask you, what is the prognosis for a person who has been diagnosed with PAD? If detected early and treated early enough, can lower limb amputation be avoided? Yeah, so... You know, that's that's the good news, right? The first thing I'm going to say about this is if I went into a room of 100 patients and I said, have you ever heard about a heart attack? A um, 100 of them would say, of course I have. If I went into that same room and said, have you ever heard about a stroke? A 100 of them would say, of course I have. If I walked in and said, have you ever heard about peripheral artery disease, PAD? They'll be like, PA what? Um, so the first thing that I'm going to say is that there is an awareness problem, right? P um, peripheral artery disease really doesn't have a great name. It sounds like it's peripheral to your health. It's not central. And the thing that people have to remember is that peripheral artery disease significantly increases your risk of stroke, significantly increases your risk of heart attack, and significantly increases your risk of having an amputation. The best treatment 
is early treatment and early detection. And that significantly reduces your risk of one of these vascular complications and an amputation. The other thing I want to point out is that it's very, very important that when you go to your doctor, if you have a family history of peripheral artery disease, you let them know that because it runs in families. So again, that's another opportunity for your doctor to early on make the diagnosis. But the point I want to make is that early detection, early treatment, early management, modification of those risk factors that um, Dr. Isaacs and myself talked about is the best treatment to prevent an amputation complication. Wonderful. Thank you. That is hopeful. Dr. Silva, can you share with us how effective the treatments are for diabetic eye disease? And again, if treated early enough, how much risk is there of reducing blindness? Yeah, so I'd like to emphasize that diabetic eye disease, blindness from diabetic eye disease is largely preventable. I think what's essential is a multidisciplinary approach, meaning having all diabetes care providers have an effective means of communicating with each other. Since really what we want to achieve is getting patients within range and get their, getting their blood sugars uh, under better control. Since this has the potential to substantially reduce the risk for the development and progression of diabetic retinal complications. Furthermore, medical management of eye complications is more effective when the disease is early, when people have early retinopathy and they have no ocular symptoms. I would really want to emphasize that systemic control or systemic management is the foundation for diabetes, diabetic retinopathy care. Timely and ongoing eye care is essential to preserving vision. If we're able to, if we're able to optimally manage diabetes in its associated conditions with appropriate eye care, the risk for visual loss can be reduced by over 96%. Wonderful. Thank you. And I have one final question for Dr. Amador, and I know that he's getting situated in his new um, space. So uh, thank you uh, for making that happen. But can you share with us what the new advancements have been for treating diabetic eye diseases and how much better the chances are for somebody who's diagnosed now um, to retain their vision? It sounds like we're moving in the right direction from what Dr. Silva shared. Definitely. Can, can you hear me well? Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, apologies. I had some uh, technical issues, but fortunately, I was able to transition. Thank you for the, the support. So, so new therapies, first of all, it's always best the early we can start treating patients. So overall, the, the, the thing that will impact the most vision-wise long-term will be early detection. So even though we there's already a, a lot of good or great therapies, the early we start intervening, the better. So there has to be awareness because even though diabetic retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy tends to be a very slow kind of disease. So people might already have it without actually know they have it. So number one, screening is definitely the thing that will impact the most vision-wise. Uh, second, if there's already complications, then we can start treating and there's a lot of different in very innovative treatments that are currently kind of appearing in the market. Uh, they will definitely help and, and, and prolong and allow patients to have great vision for, for many, many years, which is something that before the, 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 the development of these uh, drugs, it was very, very difficult to keep. And um, as Dr. Paulo was kind of mentioning, there's also the laser therapy, but that's not ideal because you're destroying the retina. So the injections are kind of the mainline treatment right now for the, the for this uh, macular edema complication. Uh, so again, ex exciting times for patients, uh, especially mostly focused on on the burden burdening of the of the treatment part because injections are now lasting longer, the drug is lasting longer in the eye, and patients require less injections, and potentially could be a, there could be a moment in which patients can stop requiring them. So we, the, we are getting there. And so it's definitely a, a good and exciting time to, 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 work, to study it. it. It definitely is. Thank you so much. So my last question is for Dr. Isaacs. 
because you're dealing with patients every single day, um, probably 24 hours a day if they're like me, what is the best way to empower people who are living with diabetes to make sure that they are getting the care, getting these screenings to make sure that they can maintain their best health? Well, for, for starters, I definitely recommend that every person with diabetes has a diabetes care and education specialist, formerly called the diabetes educator. But this can be your go-to person that you can see more frequently and discuss all things diabetes. Um, because we know often the endocrinologist or your primary care provider, you may have more limited time. I know at our institution, usually those visits are only 20 minutes. Also, we all try to stay up to date on guidelines and new therapies, but it's hard. Uh, I can tell you with my work on uh, the American Diabetes Association standards of care guidelines, those they're updated every year, but then we have living updates that come out a few times in the year. And you can imagine for a busy healthcare professional, it can be really hard to stay up to date. And then on top of that, other organizations come out with guidelines too. So you, as the person with diabetes, are your best advocate. And so attending programs like these, trying to stay up to date and learning about what's new out there, and you can bring it to your healthcare team. And also, I just want to come back to time and range. I think continuous glucose monitoring has been an incredible tool that allows you to really see what's going on, to see fluctuations to see how you're affected by different things. And so you don't have to wait three months till your next appointment. You can see what's happening now. Also, virtual care has made it easier to connect with your healthcare team. So I encourage you to take advantage of all those things, but be your own advocate um, because you're the one making the decisions all day long. Absolutely. When I was diagnosed, I completely deferred to my doctor because I didn't know anything. And as I've spent more time in this space and learned more from wonderful programs like this, I have continuously gone to my endocrinologist and my healthcare team members and kept asking questions. And sometimes we, we try new things and sometimes we have to revert to old ways, but they very much appreciate that. And I think that, you know, you want a healthcare team who wants to be a partner with you. So I love that. And I hope that we are empowering our audience members to, to be proactive and empowered for themselves. So thank you guys so much for this enlightening conversation. We have gotten several um, questions coming in from our audience. And so I want to turn right to that. If you guys don't mind, we'll just keep everything going. Um, we have uh, several questions for Dr. Brown about PAD. So um, I'm first going to ask you, who can do an ABI um, is it done by a general practitioner, an internist, an endo, a specialist? Can you do it to yourself? Who should be doing those? Yeah, so so you know, so uh, ABI is a very very simple test. As I said, it's basically checking the blood pressure in your both legs and comparing it to the blood pressure in your arm. V very very straightforward. But it is not done in the offices of internists and general practitioners in general. Um, usually it's done in the office of a vascular surgeon, in the office of a cardiologist, in the radiology department of a um, hospital, um, in an imaging center. That's generally where they are done. Anyone, though, can send a patient for an ABI. So you don't have to see a cardiologist or a vascular surgeon to get an ABI done. Any physician that you see can make that referral. I do want to point one thing out, though. You have to force your doctors to examine your feet. Now, what, 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 what do I mean by that? You know, when I um, started practicing cardiology in the year 2000, uh, I'm not trying to date myself, but I literally had 45 minutes to an hour for every patient that I saw. And then that became... 40 minutes, then 35, then 30, and now it's about 15 minutes. And if you think about 15 minutes from the time the patient entered the room to when they leave, plus a nurse checking them in and um, dealing with an electronic health um, system, all that stuff, the doctor really only has about seven minutes for each encounter with the patient. One of the things that is often ignored is an examination of the feet 
because you have seven minutes to talk about a ton of things, to examine the heart, the lungs, to look into the ears, the eyes, whatever. So when I say force your doctor to examine your feet, when you go in as a diabetic, you take off your shoes, you take off your socks. When you have naked toes dangling in your doctor's face, they have to pay attention to it, right? So make them examine it because quite frankly, if they examine your feet and detect that your pulses are diminished, that is absolutely an indication for you to be referred for an ABI. The other thing is, again, if you have any symptoms attributable to your lower extremities, numbness, pain when you walk, hair loss, uh, you know, a, a, a sore on your foot that is not healing, cold feet, any of those things, please mention it to your doctor because any of those symptoms in a diabetic person is an indication to have an ABI done. Don't be afraid to force your doctor to examine your feet. Do not keep symptoms of your low extremity to yourself. Your healthcare provider needs to be aware of these. And then the final thing I wanna add is quite fr frankly, educate yourself. You need to educate yourself about peripheral artery disease. So if you have a pen, I'd like you to write, jot this down. There is a website, www.savelegschangelives.com. Look it up. There's a ton of information there in regards to peripheral artery disease that I think will be very, very helpful to you and your health. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Just a quick follow-up question. Um, some people see their endocrinologist or their diabetes specialist, you know, three times a year, twice a year, once a year. How often should we have our naked toes dangling in front of our healthcare provider team? You know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm curious um, what Dr. Isaacs thinks about that question. I, I'd be curious about her thoughts. You know, because I'm a, um, a, a cardiologist, every time a patient came to me, you know, I, I, I examined um, their feet. And, you know, as I said, a diabetic person in particular, their risk of vascular disease is much, much higher than a non-diabetic. So, you know, I, in general, saw most of my patients about every six months to uh, once a year. So I would say that frequency is probably adequate, um, but I'm curious what Dr. Isaacs thinks. Yeah, so I mean, our, our guidelines recommend at least once a year, and we have that like in our electronic health record, right, the health maintenance to make sure we do it. But to your point, I think it's great advice, like just take those shoes off, those socks off and do it more frequently because also it, we want to teach people the importance of checking feet daily as well um, in between those visits and make sure nothing is, is gotten in there. There's no open wounds that are starting to develop or any problems. So at minimum once a year, but more frequently and definitely if there's any like any problems more often. Wonderful. All right. So moving up from the feet up to the eyes, um, Dr. Almodora, I'm going to ask you to weigh in on this first. And then Dr. Silva, if you have any additional thoughts, um, we have a question about reversing background retinopathy in the eye through better blood glucose management. Is this possible? <laughs> Definitely, there there is uh, a benefit on managing your your diabetes, on on trying to control it or, or to manage it as as best as possible, in in the diabetic retinopathy part. So we're always we need to remember that we're trying to keep it as as best as we can. So the the reversal part uh, might be a little bit more challenging to understand or to or to see. Uh, but definitely keeping it as best as possible. So that's why as entering or, or doing screenings as early as possible, as regular as possible, will help with this. Um, there is some evidence that shows that diabetic retinopathy can improve with uh, better management. But again, it's it's all about keeping our expectations very, very well, well handled and try to always keep us the best possible with good diabetic management. Dr. Silva, anything, any yeah. other additional points to add? I'd like to emphasize really, you know, it's very important that we keep our sugars within range, especially when we have early disease. When disease is early, this is when 
keeping your blood sugars within range is highly effective. Uh, it prevents worsening of your diabetes, prevents worsening of your diabetic eye condition, and it prevents visual loss. Um, our next question is for Dr. Isaacs. Um, somebody, I love this question, asked, what is the benefit or what are the benefits of better time and range? And is there anything specific health improvement wise that a, somebody who's living with diabetes could expect if they had, so 70% time and range is the goal, but if they get up to 85, is there you know, a significant difference that they could experience? I love the question. <laughs> So also, just in case anyone's not aware, time and range generally refers to 70 to 180. So the goal for most people is that magic 70%, which I love because we're not asking for perfection. We're asking for 70%. And where that kind of comes from is that 70% time and range correlates very well with an A1C around 7%, which is the goal for most people. Now, in theory, if let's say someone's 85% time in range, you would expect that A1C would be lower. It would be significantly lower than 7%. So there's some data to show that A1Cs that are lower, like around 6%, let's say, um, have reduced microvascular complications. So things like the kidney disease, um, you know, eye conditions and things like that. Now we don't necessarily have the proof with time and range that 85% is definitely going to reduce those complications compared to 70%. And the reason why we don't recommend 85% for everyone is because it can be challenging to reach that without having a lot of hypoglycemia or low blood sugars. And so that's kind of the, the benefit versus risk and why we don't ask people to have A1Cs of 6% and time and range of 85%. But if you can do it safely and you're not experiencing hypoglycemia, then hey, why not? Um, so I guess that's the long-winded answer that there may be some benefit, but for most that 70% should give you a very good chance of reducing risk of complications. Wonderful, thank you. All right, our next question comes from Patricia, and she's saying that she has heard that statins or cholesterol-lowering lowering medicines can also cause or contribute to diabetes. Uh, Dr. Brown, she would like to know why docs think the benefits outweigh the risk. And this is a topic that I turn over to you completely because this is, I haven't heard this before. Yeah, so, so let's talk about the medicines that are used to lower the cholesterol because we know high cholesterol is a risk factor for developing plaques in the um, arteries. So there's um, injectable medications actually that you can use. Um, one of them is called a PCSK9 inhibitor. It blocks a, a protein in the blood, which significantly reduces your um, cholesterol levels. Now, you got to think of it that over 90% of the cholesterol in your blood is made in your liver. So if you can reduce production of cholesterol in the liver, your cholesterol levels will be lower. And what statin drugs are, there are there are medications that block an enzyme in the liver cell leading to lower cholesterol levels. And there is some evidence that there is a correlation with um, statin usage and increased risk of diabetes. Um, that, 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 that is a true statement. It is not a significant increase. But if you look at the benefits of being on a statin and reducing your risk of vascular events, there's no question that the benefits are significantly higher than the risk. Now, when we put someone on a statin, there is a blood test that we follow generally. That's something called the low density lipoprotein or LDL. And in diabetics, we try to drive that to less than 70. So that's a number that you should know. But there is also evidence that if you're on a statin, even if you get your LDL down, there is an additional benefit from the statin called the pleiotropic effect, where it seems to be protective of events in arteries beyond its ability to lower the cholesterol. So it's not just the cholesterol lowering effect of the statins that's beneficial. The drug, the class by itself has really good effects, and it probably has to do with reducing inflammation inside those arteries. And why is inflammation important? If you think of the inside of your artery as a saran wrap, 
and you think of, you know, a, a cholesterol plaque as an apple, and you put that saran wrap on the apple, it won't stick. But if you then put it in a microwave and you start heating it up, that saran wrap is going to start sticking to that apple. So when that inner lining of your blood vessel becomes inflamed, it wants cholesterol to stick to it even more. So statins kind of reduce that inflammation and makes that inner lining of the artery less likely to cause cholesterol to stick to it. So even if you lower the cholesterol with statin, you're also getting that additional benefit. So without question in my mind, the benefits of statins way, way, way out, uh, outweigh the small risk of um, increased diabetes. Wow, thank you for sharing all that. That um, was really good information and hopefully helps uh, Patricia. Our next question is for Dr. Silva and it comes from Pam who has been living with type one diabetes for 40 years and um, asks, what if you maintain tight control, I'm assuming of your blood glucose, but you still end up with macular edema? What could possibly explain this? So the main risk factors for developing eye complications from diabetes is just the duration you've had it. So sometimes, uh, even if you've had excellent, you know, control of your diabetes and all the associated medical problems, uh, you can still develop these complications. So it's very important that you get your eyes examined. So these can be captured early and treated appropriately. So even if you develop these conditions with existing treatment modalities that we have, the risk for visual loss can be minimized. So the essential part here is really to get your eyes examined on a routine basis. All right, thank you. Well, our, oh, yep, we just keep, the questions keep coming. Thank you guys. It's wonderful to hear from the audience and we're so glad that we have the time to answer your questions. Um, we have a question for Dr. Isaac. If you have an A1C, say 10.0, for 20 years, but don't have any noticeable serious issues yet. And then you can get your A1C down to six and keep it there. Is the damage already done? Is it reversible? What What's your prognosis for the future? So I would say kudos to getting the A1C down to 6%. And we should focus on now and the future. So, I mean, you, there's no way to know exactly what happened in those 20 years. If you don't have complications at that point, that that's great news, right? I mean, it's kind of like if someone, I, I think of the analogy like someone is smoking, uh, they smoked for 20, 30 years. Uh, we know there's tremendous health benefits by stopping. So we don't think about what happened. And I know like my grandma smoked for like, I don't know, 40 maybe 50 years and lived until 99. So I would say, don't just don't worry about it. Focus on the now. That's amazing. What can you do today to the future? And hopefully your future will be bright and you'll minimize complications. Wonderful. Would any of our other doctors like to weigh in from a PAD or a diabetic eye disease perspective? You know, from a PAD um, perspective, and so I'm talking about big blood vessels, right? Not the small blood vessels in the eye. There's no question that um, that type of disease is reversible. Uh, meaning that if you get your cholesterol, for instance, down significantly, there can be regression of plaque formation in blood vessels. Likewise, you know, if you now have your blood sugars well, well controlled over time, we would expect some regression of plaque formation in those arteries. So the short answer, in my opinion, um, to that question is yes, that if you sort of all of a sudden really change your life and get your risk factors and your hemoglobin A1C down, there can be some reversal of any damage that's there already. I just want to add, though, I am not encouraging people to smoke. <laughs> it's a risk factor. My grandma years. was a little lucky, but, um, but my point is, even if you didn't have the healthiest behaviors, if you change now, that makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Yeah, ch chiming in for the ophthalmologic part, uh, man good management always helps. It's always beneficial. Just if you go from 10 to 6, will definitely help. It's something that, that and, and congratulations if, if this is like a, a personal story, uh, because it's it, it's something that will, will look 
will uh, will make the disease first progress slowly or or just stay as as as, as it is for for longer uh and also will help uh with the, how the treatment with the treatment response uh there has been association the higher the h one c the 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 slower the patients respond to the treatment so definitely lowering that hba one c even from 10 to 6 helps a lot yeah i can't emphasize it enough that keeping your sugars under un, within range is really what we want to achieve to prevent you know diabetic eye complications just by keeping your sugars under control you can reduce the risk for developing or worsening of the eye complications by over 60% you know just by keeping it under range that's wonderful well thank you all for everybody who asked a question, thank you so much. We really appreciate hearing from you and to these amazing panelists. I feel like my brain grew three times in size tonight. You guys provided us with wonderful information. And I think for me, the takeaway is make sure you're getting your screenings, make sure you're talking to your healthcare providers, make sure you're st keeping your blood glucose levels in range and just keep taking care of yourself and being empowered. I cannot thank you all enough. We will stay online for the next half hour to give everyone an opportunity to do some community networking. So you can click um, on the left side of the screen where the people icon is and uh, meet other people who are you know, living with this disease or maybe one of our panelists will join there. But we um, have really appreciated everyone's time tonight and just wanna say thank you to everybody who was involved with tonight's panel. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much.